Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this fall 2021 forum lecture series event. My name is Reb Green. I'm an English language learning specialist in the first year experience and the forum curricular coordinator for this year. So while the opening speakers last month, Angela Carroll and Eduardo Corral, aka Flawlock, shared their work across all of the forum themes, identity, community, universality, the remaining speakers will present on each in more depth. So this month's event will further explore this broad theme of identity. Author Emily McDowell writes, finding yourself is not really how it works. You're not a $10 bill lost in last winter's coat pocket. You are not lost. Your true self is right there, buried under cultural conditioning, other people's opinions, and inaccurate conclusions you drew as a kid that became your beliefs about who you are. Finding yourself is actually a returning to yourself, an unlearning, an excavation, a remembering who you were before the world got its hands on you. I'll now introduce Micah FYE faculty members, Timo Kuzme and Latoya Hobbs, who will share on their creative practices as they relate to this theme of identity. Timo Kuzme, they are a visual artist from Brooklyn, New York, that is currently living and teaching in Baltimore, Maryland and Philadelphia, PA. They have a BFA from the Pratt Institute and an MFA from the Leroy E. Hofberger School of Painting here at MICA with concentrations in critical studies and teaching. In addition to fine arts and humanities, they have backgrounds in haute couture and wearable art. Timo's work currently explores the nature of being and becoming deciphering body and identity through the felt rhythmic languages of paint, mark making and performance. Next, we'll hear from Latoya M. Hobbs, an artist, wife and mother of two from Little Rock, Arkansas, who's currently living and working in Baltimore, Maryland. She received her BA in painting from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock and MFA in printmaking from Purdue University. Latoya's work deals with figurative imagery that addresses the ideas of beauty, womanhood, and cultural identity as they relate to women of the African diaspora. She creates a fluid and symbiotic relationship between her printmaking and painting practice, producing works that are marked by texture, color, and bold patterns. Um, as a note to all of you viewing, the chat box will be turned off. However, the Q&A function um, in your bottom dock will be available. So if you would like to ask a question to one of the speakers, um, you can do that and, and they will get back to you um, via the Q&A option, via text um, before, before the session is out. And if not, then um, get back to you with an answer um, when the talk is over. So. Thank you all for your continued attention as it is of the highest currency. And I'm so excited to be inspired by these two artists and to better understand how they have used the creative process to return to themselves. Thank you, Timo. Thank you. Um, everybody can hear me, thumbs up. Great. Thank you, Michelle's class, you're great. <laughs> all right, let me just share my screen real quick. Share screen. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, as Reb said, my name is Timo Kuzme. Um, I hope you're having a great Monday. Um, we just got out of class and I'm excited to be with you today. Uh, I use they, them, they, them pronouns. I am a, a newer FYE professor and a fine artist from Brooklyn, New York. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure to get to talk to you today about my work as it pertains to identity. Um, I'm excited to go in on a little adventure with you today to go deep. We're going to get a little personal and at times quite philosophical. Uh, we will get into how my work evolved as well as the new horizons it's currently embarking on. Now, today's talk is going to be a very pared down version of my experience and the philosophies and ideas that go into it and what has evolved from that. Um, we're only going to have time to kind of scrape the surface of the, uh, the concepts that go into it. But if you're interested in going deep, or you have a question, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I would love to chat further. Um, you know, I've got my contact at my Instagram and my website and my mic email up on the screen. Um, also, I am working on a book, getting it published by hopefully this year-ish um, that will go more into this. I've also got a, a catalog of mine from my thesis that I did at uh, MICA several years ago um, that will be available in Decker Library at the end of the month. 
Um, so check that out. You'll be able to even take it out and bring it home and uh, look at my work and read some of my writing. Um, intertwined in this narrative um, is my own personal evolution, not just that of my work. Um, and that evolution is not necessarily that of my being, but my understanding of it. Who I am has kind of always been there, but I'm kind of learning more as I go. So let's start there with the evolution of me understanding myself. Um, as a note, all the work in this presentation is mine, unless otherwise noted. Um, and feel free to ask if you have any questions about the material afterwards. All right. Okay. Well, this one, I don't know who actually took this picture, but <laughs> so you got me. But this is me as a small fry. Uh, at birth, my assigned name was Timothy Kozmeski, traditional and Polish, but both were fabricated. I am actually mostly Italian, and this was a surname invented by a great, great relative to find employment during the Depression. Uh, and I love my parents dearly. Um, you know, they've been dressing me up in funny costumes since as long as I can remember. But as I grew to understand who I was on the inside, I grew more uncomfortable with my given moniker. Problem was any new name I tried to adopt felt even less like me. So I chopped the last three letters off both names to remove ties to traditional signification while still orbiting a certain familiarity. This is also me, a, a wee bit older. Uh, my identity, uh, to the best of my understanding, if I was to put it into words, is that I am an agender omnisexual person. Put simply, this means that I don't identify with a gender, and I'll explain what that means as we go through the presentation, and I am attracted to the full spectrum of peoples. And this is also me and my wiener dog beans. He's in a backpack and he has a helmet on, yes, but safety first. And this is also me, but this is also me, as well as this. In fact, this might contain more descriptors of my being than the previously mentioned names, labels, and identifiers. Oops, this is also me. And lastly, this even this is me. But let's rewind a little bit before we fall down this rabbit hole. I'm gonna take you on a quick detour of my work before I discovered my inner voice within it. For a decade, I was a couture designer and dressmaker. I was fascinated with the human body and to try and understand it better, I created upon it. To comprehend it, I, I tried to comprehend the body using architectural forms and poetic materials. On the right here is one of my friends and trans heroes, Puya Moseni, wearing a sculpted piece in the film, The Unwanted Guest. They have a good social media present and are a great activist for the community. Um, so feel free to look them up on Instagram or other places. Uh, here is a, here's one of the pieces that Lady Gaga destroyed. And, um, and this was a, an architectural piece I made inspired by Fritz Lang's great film, Metropolis. And here is a, a, a gown that I hand embroidered um, to kind of play with architectural illusion on like a really organic flowy gown that's very body conscious. Now those past pieces were from my own atelier um, in, in Brooklyn and for a little bit in Europe. Um, but I also worked in New York and Europe at such companies such as Givenchy, Jay Mandel, Victor and Rolf, um, which is shown here when we were showing in Paris Fashion Week, here's some of the pieces that I um, helped design and fabricate and uh, send down the runway. But on top of the distaste of being involved in an industry fashion, that was destroying the environment. It was perpetuating false paradigms for body image and a whole mess of other vapid capitalist structures and games. For me, the medium proved too limiting. It only felt like a diluted illustration of my inspiration. My value was enmeshed in rigor fetishism, fetishizing doing something really detailed, not about the concept as a whole. And it was also enmeshed in like white patriarchal expectations and an ability to play a fake political game my creative voice was muted below layers of, well, I mean, look at the picture, it was muted. Um, you know, am I jaded? Sure. Does art have a lot of this stuff too? Yeah, definitely. But there was something else with art that I wasn't finding in this other craft. I've always painted. And when I was designing a new collection based off my paintings, instead of like pulling someone else's art, I discovered a voice. It was very faint at first, 
but it was an, an emergent expression that did not communicate through language and previously understood structures to me. This is where we return to my scribbling and abstract mark making that I was showing you before. In this case, this blob. Some of my students have seen this blob. I'm sorry to make you revisit this blob. But while I uncover this inner creative voice, I, sim I simultaneously uncovered an inner self that felt more true. It's hard to describe, but we're gonna try today. See if I can get this to play. For years, I felt like a walking dichotomy, both detached from my organism I existed within and yet encountering my sense of self within this afferent, which means neurological, biological, and physical systems that constitute the rest of my experience of the whole world. I regularly experienced myself in a removed state as an inner witness, a phenomenon known as internal or external autoscopia, the sense of living within the body, a feeling of the body felt under the body, the body of an amorphous energetic self under a structure of fixed outward facing flesh. Just getting the computer to decide to, whoop, to there we are. I'd experienced this autoscopia from as early as I can remember in life. And I had a dissatisfaction with not just how I presented, but with the organism as a whole. When I made wonderful trans friends later on in life and we talked about our bodies, my experience seemed to diverge from there some, as I did not feel that I had a potential truer self that I could transition to to represent who I was on the inside or even a spectrum to flow beautifully in between. Now, I think it's very important to note that trans means a lot of things for many people and I am here for all of them. For now, I'm only speaking in relation to the journeys I heard about in conversations with my friends thus far. Over a decade earlier, due to this built up dissatisfaction and a removed witness state of self, I had begun to try to discover hidden potentials within myself. This was through regular meditation, where I would enter heightened states of sensory sensitivity through breathing, mindfulness, kundalini, neo-tantra. And here I discovered a way to celebrate and connect with my organism on its terms though. Here in the body, I found something that felt more like me than I'd ever previously experienced. A self made up of vibratory sensation, a being in flux born of intensities. We once again return to the blob. The first time I laid down to try and paint while I was meditating and accessed, accessing this energetic self, needless to say, it didn't work too well. I got this. The brush wasn't loaded with paint. It was loaded with expectations and cliches. I wasn't able to let go to allow space for the energetic self to emerge, but I also couldn't paint. It was a stalemate, but I kept trying and trying and trying. And then this happened. It doesn't look like much, I know, but this was the breakthrough moment laying on a mattress lofted in a code non-compliant non apartment in Brooklyn, I maintained the pattern breathing I needed to leave space for the sensation to rise. And I assumed a passive position in a neurological feedback loop where my nervous system was finally able to elevate past its like standard default sense ceiling into a super state while I was holding that brush. This time it was just a small dagger brush dipped in ink, but nonetheless, as with experiencing a sound wave, these sensations, with these sensations, all I had to do was, was listen with my body, not my ears, but you know what I mean. I could, I could initiate this call, this, this wave in my body through a bodily trigger like a muscle contraction, but that wasn't even necessary for even imperceptible like micro movements would initiate the waves of these feedback loops. For example, the minute scratch, of a brush's ferrule moving across the weave of a canvas due to gravity or my heartbeat was enough to send a tiny sensation through me that would swell and swell and eventually become large enough to be perceptible. These initial waves would traverse my body and echo back. That echo would cause the brush to move again, but that in turn would create new sensations and the cycle would repeat. This inner self that 
was made of sensation and it was in conversation with the painting and it was being transcribed. But what was this being of sensation conversing with the painting? The me I knew, Timo, was sitting to the side and watching. It reminded me of something I'd read about in The Logic of Sensation by Gilles Deleuze about the work of the painter Francis Bacon. That is the concept of the body without organs. It is an intentionally overloaded and provocative concept, but let's talk briefly about it on a basic level as it pertains to us. It's not so much a body with no organs, rather it is opposed to the organization of organs. Don't worry, I will explain everything. Every one of our actual bodies, our organisms, has a limited set of traits, habits, movements, affects, etc. But every actual body also has a virtual dimension, a vast reservoir of potential traits, potential connections, potential affects, potential movements. This collection of potentials underneath is what uh, Deleuze calls the body without organs. All right. We're going to get abstract for a bit, but I promise I'll reel it back in. I got fancy diagrams. I got lists with bullets. We'll get through this together, but I think it's important. So imagine that this gray space on this diagram with, with the yellow dots moving around, the disorganized ones, that is this virtual body, this body without organs, this neutral, receptive, ready to be hit by incoming forces body, full of potentials. And the particles, the little gray dots bumping around are outside forces, intensities is what we also call them. Now organs form, let's just loose term organs form when the forces hit the yellow dots, directing them in one way or another. Each time the blue line changes direction, because that's tracing the, the path of the yellow dots, that's a new organ forming. As new organs form, systems are built. Those are the blue lines. And unlike our actual like flesh bodies, these organs and systems are non-hierarchical, meaning there isn't like a levels of importance or order that's set up ahead of time. And they're called polyvalent, meaning they take on forms based on the circumstances in which they're created. Now, actually I'll go back to that diagram for a moment, just to kind of explain where I'm coming from. So, the inner self that I was accessing with the meditation is the gray area and the yellow dots, which without any incoming forces would just be stationary. But all the sensations moving through my neurological network coming from the experience of painting are the gray things moving around. And as they interact with this inner receptive self and create sensation and vibration, these organs and systems form. So in a way, there's this new type of body that is being built from the inside through the process of painting. But what are these organs? They are different for each type of body. But in a human body, they are vibratory sensation, a point where there is action similar to the traditional organs in the body, a flux between like a contraction and an expansion, kind of like what the heart does. Um, those in my class today, Carol Lee Schneeman was talking about it. I have learned that if you pay close enough attention and do not let your conscious self get in the way, you can sense them. They might be a little faint at first, but you can sense them. But again, they are provisional organs. This provisional organ is determined by the conditions of each encounter of the incoming intensity and the potentials of the virtual body. What was once my hand because of what happened and the sensations moving through me now energetically feels like my chest. And what was once my hip now feels like a mouth, an orifice, open, screaming. This results in a body, a body, and subsequent systems formed solely by the interaction of this virtual self and the art, not the organism and the larger societal systems that codify, order, and stratify the body in order to extract labor, production, meaning, function, those sorts of things. But I did not want to just create a record of the experience. The body was communicating with the medium paint. So I wanted to ask questions and learn more about it through paint, not through traditional language or logic, but through affects and intensities, art. The more I did this, the more it felt like the actual me. After years of practice, this is now what I identify with, 
a less tangible sense of self, but one that feels more home, that I feel more home in than anything else I've experienced. Through a lot of practice, I was able to teach myself to do this while standing so that I could step out of the meditation and respond with the medium to the previous marks with squeegees, fingers, blades, you name it, and occasionally a brush, I was able to open space for material becomings, which are moments where the paint takes on a life of its own. Additionally, when I would dive back in after stepping back, my body would sense the previous marks, the ridges, the divots, the texture changes, and this would color the new incoming intensities and subsequent sensations and thus the future marks. It was a feedback loop to its fullest. Now, this is where we flip. We're looking, well, previously we were looking from within the art. Now we're gonna flip around and look at the art as the viewer. I mentioned the painting taking on a life of its own, or at least the paint. I mean this actually literally and not just the representation of a force, but the systems, territories, and milieus that make up life for all of us in our daily lives are happening within the painting. In my book, I really break this down, but let's look at it briefly here. We can use this work of mine as an example. An alizarin-tinted alizarin -tinted painted form on a canvas stands strong with a warm inner glow of vitality peeking through a sturdy skeleton of opaque impasto. Its energy seeks to dance around the canvas, but thin rays of canacridone violet mixed with a touch of perylene crimson delimit the core of this form, establishing an initially delicate but ultimately superior force within the painting. These lines through exp their expressiveness in the formal qualities in relation to the lively pink form in the center establish a virtual architecture, a territory. Now, although they might first seem like two simple forms on a canvas, the interaction of their forces, unmetered, but nonetheless rhythmic, induces expressiveness, sensation, territorialization, and also conversely, deterritorialization. Now, this is already embedded in the canvas, whether we are there to view it or not. But what happens when there is a viewer present, one effective and affecting being addressing another effective and effective being? Again, I go more into detail in my writing, but through the process of our perception in time, an evolution takes place, the evolution of new life, an in-between empathic being created by us and the painting or other types of art. That brings us back to our favorite animation. I know you're glad it's back, Brownie in motion. This time, think of the gray as the space between us and the painting, the air between us and the painting. And the small particles are incoming effective intensities from the material life of the painting, meaning what you feel when you experience art. That's the gray dots. Our perception is the yellow dots being directed around by the painting. For example, a bright cerulean pulls you to the left, but a chromatic black bar keeps your gaze at bay, while a strong yellow in the corner tempts you into its calm, secure armature. The blue lines, these systems, are formed in time in your memory as you move around the painting. But because they're building on each other, they color each subsequent encounter with the parts of the painting that you just previously took in. So the fact that you are going from that black bar to that yellow armature, you're affected by the like, strangeness and the strength of that black bar, not just the yellow armature, it builds on itself. So those systems, the blue lines are made as well. In the same way that the body without organs formed in the virtual space of ourselves, here, a new body is also being formed in the virtual space between us and the work. I call it a body without organs, without a body. I know. <laughs> but it's a fun term. This is, the, this is only possible in a space of experiencing and seeing like one another beyond the world of appearances, in a space of like true understanding, in a space of empathy. This is where I am now. I have been working on develop, developing a possible method to communicate with the deepest limits of oneself in a way that can be understood by others in sense-based language opening up the possibilities to communicate about parts of ourselves where traditional language and 
other signification fall short. But it's very, very important to note that this is not a universal underlying humanist that we all share. Someone would be mistaken to try and stop folks from seeing each other's outside differences and instead just look at the inner beauty. Instead, it's quite the opposite. It's about finding ways to communicate about the complex nuanced uniqueness that each of us have in an infinite language on the terms of the condition and not in a limited system of signs and words. So in conjunction with my art, book, teaching, community art, which if you have time at the end, I'll show you some of, and a YouTube series, um, I am uh, producing and making work for a large show and conference with a dear professor and friend of mine at Pratt Institute, Ethan Spiglin. This and the next two slides are kind of like a teaser of what we're putting together. As a society, we're in a renaissance of thinking about identity. Getting to know and listen to your incoming class talk about these subjects is proof. A big reason for this is that we are blessed with contemporary artists, activists, thinkers from all walks of life that have taken brilliant yet possibly rusty theories and polished and proved them with new perspectives and evolved discourse. The multi-city event that I'm creating will bring together these artists, activists, performers, philosophers from around the globe that have been inspired by the foundations laid down by mid-century philosophers like that of Deleuze or other similarly futuristic post-structural ways of thinking and creating. Um, this in the previous slides is a sampling of who we're aiming to have included if all goes right with the funding in the end. But they will showcase and present their art, their performances, talks, workshops, and more around the contemporizing of these discourses and how they've grown like the discourse, you know, polished that rusty stuff with their art, action, writing perspectives and experience. Now, it's very important to me that the event is not just an academic white walled gallery bubble where we dream of better futures, but instead take action. So I'm working on partnering with several groups such as here, GLITS. Uh, they're an on the ground activist group promoting the health and well being of trans folks, especially trans people of color and sex workers. They're an incredible group that take to the streets and enable real change through projects such as creating housing for the folks that need it most, thus fulfilling a baseline set of life needs so that folks may blossom into their best selves safely and you know, well, as we all deserve. And another organization in my home in, in Philadelphia, uh, Spiral Q, an arts and activism organization that builds strong and equitable communities character, characterized by creativity, joy, can-do attitudes, and the courage to act on their convictions. They take to the literal streets with unflinching and joyous commitment for justice and equality. They unleash the power of art to connect people, actions, values, neighborhoods, organizations, movements, all to each other and to their collective creative force for change. It's very important to me that my personal work also follow this trajectory. Years ago now, the, doc, the amazing Dr. Mel Lewis here at MICA introduced me to the brilliant Jasper Puar, a philosopher and writer on queer studies and women of color feminisms, as well as a professor and graduate director of women and gender studies at Rutgers. In her work, she goes deep into the necessary friction between the concept of intersectionality, the brilliant Kimberly Williams Crenshaw's term for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege and assemblages, the metaphysical systems we were talking about earlier. I don't know that what this means for my work yet, but, I, now, but now that I have learned to build the assemblage of my inner being, I'm very passionate about investigating what this friction means to me and holding space for others to do the same. Right now, I'm excited about returning to the experimental performance. This here, this picture is my new theremin, an instrument played with your body like no other. But to find out what I mean, you'll have to come watch my performance to learn more. Again, to keep in touch with me, uh, find me on Instagram at Timo Kuzme. Uh, my Micah email address is up there as well, tkuzme at Micah. Um, and then do I have like one minute to share some, uh, community art that I had worked on. You know what? We're just gonna do it real quick. Um, so here are some mobile um, community art pieces where we created dinosaurs and praying mantises and those sorts of things and, all that, and brought them to parks and events and allowed people to kind of find their expression within them. You can climb up in them, you can paint on them. 
there was a traveling puppet theater that I was part of running. Um, we would spin off classic films and stuff like that um, and do puppet shows. Um, my claim to fame here is that someone got engaged in the audience during one of our shows. We would make um, installation art with LEDs where you would um, go on to be a 360 camera and it would translate through to the computer and then blow you up on the screen. You would see yourself in ways you might not have seen before. And then working with like the youth in places like New York, Philadelphia and other places to teach them about virtues and community and learning to kind of like love and share space together and to kind of learn to accept everybody. Um, it was a really rewarding practice. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, again, reach out if you have any questions and I'll see you around campus. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me as a part of your speaker series. Um, today, I'm gonna to be talking about identity expressed through self-portraiture. Um, but before I get started, I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge Fleck, Fletcher uh, Mackey, um, amazing person, amazing force in our department and also at MICA in general. So uh, I just wanted to acknowledge his presence with me today. All right, so uh, again, my name is Latoya Hobbs, faculty in FYE. I teach drawing tradition and innovation, also life drawing. Um, I'm a mom, here's me with my family, my husband, Arison, who is also an artist. Um, I have two sons, Theo is five, my youngest, and my oldest son is Ada. He actually turns seven tomorrow. Um, in terms of my background, um, I have a BA in painting and a MFA in printmaking. And so my focus right now is kind of combining both of those more traditional practices together, creating works that kind of embed everything on the same surface, um, primarily working with figurative imagery that um, talks about issues with the Black women. Um, so throughout my presentation, you'll just kind of see different portraits that I've done over the years. And so for me, self-portraiture is important because it helps me to like investigate myself. And it's also a means for me to document specific points in my personal and also in my professional life. So the work that you see here is a woodcut titled Peace and Humility. With my printmaking practice, I primarily focus on woodcuts. Um, it's kind of like my jam right now. So this work is significant because it, it kind of marks where I really felt like I stepped into my own in terms of um, becoming a printmaker. Uh, I kind of struggled with it a lot. And honestly, I really never even intended to do printmaking, um, but I kind of just fell in love with it and, and it kind of took over in my practice for a while. Um, so this next image is from a series that I did called Beautiful Uprising. I was exploring the intersection of race, beauty, and identity as they um, concern women of African descent. And so I was exploring different um, themes. And so this work kind of reflects on hair culture. Um, it's based on a personal experience of mine when I decided to cut off all my chemically straightened hair um, and I kind of just rocked a little Afro. And so I experienced a lot of negativity primarily from other black women and other women in my community. So it caused me to really question uh, where that sense of negativity came from. Um, so this portrait here is kind of, I'm in conversation with myself. Um, and I have, you know, one image is me with this like kind of long, exaggerated straight hair. And then the other one um, is with this, you know, kind of exaggerated Afro texture here. Uh, but I'm kind of hinting at the fact that, you know, regardless of how, you know, a person wears their hair, they're still the same person um, on the inside. Uh, this next image is significant to me because um, it marks my first uh, residency experience. So in 2015, I was invited to participate in the Tula Palma International Artist Residency. Um, I was a new mom at the time. So it was, I think my son had just turned one uh, or was about to turn one. And so it was kind of sentimental to me because I was leaving him <laughs> and going away to fo focus on my work for a while. Uh, while I was at the residency, I really wanted to focus on the people that I met there, but um, I decided to do a self-portrait to kind of commemorate the experience for me. So a lot of the colors that you see and the patterns that you see um, are specifically taken and inspired from that environment. 
Uh, and this next slide just kind of shows um, me and some of the other participants from the residency. So there was somebody from Congo, from Spain, from Canada, from Cuba. So just kind of people like all over the world. So it was a really amazing experience. Uh, the next few images that I'm going to show are from a series that I'm currently working on titled Salt of the Earth. Um, if you're not familiar with that phrase, salt of the earth is taken from uh, a biblical scripture. It's listed there on the screen, Matthew 513. I won't take the time to read through it, but uh, with this series, I am personifying Black women as salt particularly thinking about the roles of us as preservers of our family and culture and community. Um, so I had the idea for this series a while ago, actually when I was in graduate school, but I didn't really start to actualize the series until maybe about three or four years ago. Um, and I really didn't understand what the series meant for me until I kind of stepped into this role of motherhood. So some things that I'm exploring within this series are uh, this idea of the matriarch, um, preservation, self-preservation. So thinking about as like a person who's constantly giving out to other people and playing all these different roles, how am I preserving myself in the process? Not myself, but also just women in general. Um, so this work is titled Birth of a Mother. Um, you can see in terms of the process, I mentioned that I am engrossed in this idea of combining my painting and printmaking practice together. So you can see there's elements from my relief carving practice, there's painting, and there's also kind of collage happening all on the same surface. So I'm really um, excited about the idea of taking these very different approaches and putting them together on the same surface in a really seamless way. Uh, so this image is me uh, when I was pregnant with my first son, um, and this is image was taken in 2014, but I didn't actually make this image until 2019. Uh, part of that is because when I first found out I was gonna be a mother, I was really consumed by fear. Um, you know, obviously fear, you know, of stepping into this role of motherhood, like, what am I doing? <laughs> am I gonna be a good mom um, in that kind of situation? But also just fearful of my career being a woman artist. Um, so I really felt like, um, I really couldn't talk about being a mom in my work that people wouldn't take it seriously. Um, but over the past couple of years, I've really started to question where those fears came from and to confront them head on. And I feel like motherhood is such a big part of my life and it's such an authentic experience to, to me that I wanted to start to share that in my work. Um, so the palette is dominated by gray, uh, partly because, you know, that was just kind of a gray area um, in my life, just kind of really thinking about things, thinking about um, this new role that I'm taking on and also thinking about how this is gonna affect my art practice. Uh, this next work is called The Everyday. So another um, painting where I'm kind of openly expressing uh, my role as a mother. This is also the first, first work that I um, have included my children um, in the painting. So it's uh, pretty significant to me. Um, I'm also taking moments to kind of highlight other artists who inspired my practice. So if you look at the kind of painting that's in the background, that's kind of a nod to Alma Thomas's work. I mean, if you're not familiar with her work, she's a, an amazing abstract artist um, who's based in uh, DC. So within this series, um, I'm thinking about the idea of the matriarch, particularly investigating the women in my family. So thinking about the traditions that uh, were passed on to me and also what I'm passing along to my sons now that I'm a mom. Uh, this piece is called How Janetta Taught Us to Pray. And it's kind of a tribute to my grandmother um, and just thinking about this uh, sense of spirituality that she um, instilled in us. Uh, so when I was younger, I would have these memories of her, my grandmother waking me and my cousins up like at the crack of dawn, like to get up and like pray and read a Bible scripture. Um, and so I remember my mom kind of telling me they, those same stories as well. So um, this is kind of a nod to her and the sense of spirituality uh, that I feel like is present in my life and also present with other women in my family. So these next few slides just kind of show um, a close up of this diptych. Um, I like to, you know, include the detail shots so you can kind of see a close up of the carving practice. And, um, and again, this is me like taking all these very different processes and putting them on the same surface. Okay, um, and so this next image uh, is called, titled Queen Anne. Um, again, another kind of tribute to my mom, but I'm also thinking about women artists who have influenced my practice as well. So in the last work, um, I mentioned that I was 
had a reference to Alma Thomas. Well, in this particular piece, I'm referencing two women artists who have been influential in my practice. One is Elizabeth Catlett. So this image over here on the left um, is a print by Elizabeth Catlett, who is an amazing, uh, who was an amazing printmaker um, and sculptor. So a lot of um, my work as a printmaker is because of her. Uh, so she's really been in influential in my practice. And also on the right here is a nod to Samela Lewis, who is a really significant art historian who has really uh, been instrumental in kind of um, cataloging the black art canon. I um, mean, again, you can see again, just this combination of all these different processes, uh, putting them together on the same surface. And then this next um, picture, excuse me, image is called Portrait of a Mother. Um, so again, just all these different portraits kind of chronicle either emotions that I've had um, during this time in my life or like specific like milestones. Um, and this happens to be one of my favorite uh, portraits that I've done so far. Um, and so one thing that I wanna point out with this work is that uh, the pattern that you see on the wall in the background is an adinkra symbol that's based on a crocodile. And so I kind of associated with that uh, that symbol with myself in this picture because uh, the crocodile is known for having the flexibility to exist on water and land. And so I feel like um, just with all the different roles that I play, I have to kind of juggle and go between all these different uh, modes at any given, given time. So I'm kind of having to exist in a lot of different spheres. I've had the flexibility to exist in a lot of different roles and functions at the same time. So the next um, series of images I'm gonna show you are from a project that I recently finished up early this year, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, the project is called Carving Out Time. Um, it's basically a life-size woodcut that takes you through my day as a mother and practicing artist. Um, so on the slide here, you can kind of see, give you a context of, of scale. So the entire work is divided into five um, scenes or five sections that kind of take you through phases of the day. Um, and all of the works together are, are like not eight feet tall, 60 feet wide. Um, so the next few images, I'm gonna show you um, kind of details of those scenes and kind of talk a little bit about um, each of them. Uh, so this first scene is called uh, Morning, uh, basically kind of showing you the start of um, the day. And so in creating this work, I had a few goals for myself. I really wanted to, number one, challenge myself with the scale, obviously. I also wanted to challenge myself by putting the figures in an environment. So with a lot of my previous work, um, I kind of had this strict format of like doing bust portraits from like the chest up, but I really wanted to push myself and think more about how I can express like narrative portraits. So giving you more information about the people other than just like their physical appearance. So I really wanted to challenge myself by putting people in environments. And also in the background, um, well, through all, all of the few images that you'll see, I have artworks on the walls. And so that serves a few purposes for me. One, just talking about the importance of collecting and exposing my children to art. Um, but also each of these works are significant because um, they are references to, again, who I, people who I consider master artists who have um, influenced my practice. And so at the top of the bed, there is another work by Elizabeth Callot on the right, and then another kind of nod to um, Alma Thomas's work. And so in this, this next slide, you can kind of see a detail of the work. Um, and so I'm, again, really thinking about um, transforming what will be like the traditional printmaking matrix, but thinking about that being an art object in and of itself. Um, so I'm actually showing the wood panels uh, in the space or when they, when they will be exhibited. Okay, this next scene is titled um, Homeschool and Housework. And so it kind of represents like the busyness of the day for me. Um, so this is kind of the period where I'm just trying to check as many things off of my to-do list as possible. Um, and so you can kind of see in the scene, like I'm homeschooling, trying to fold clothes at the same time. Um, so just kind of a lot going on. And so that was kind of the inspiration behind the title for the work. So carving out time, right? Uh, so I think we all have to kind of navigate or make negotiations for what we will make time to do and make time to accomplish within our day. Um, but it also kind of uh, nods at the duration of time that it would take to complete this work. So I started this work in August of... 2020 is when I kind of got in the studio space and started prepping all the panels and sketches. Um, and then I finished everything up um, in May of like 2021. 
Um, this is also kind of like what I think about during the pandemic um, when we were kind of in the height of it and, and a lot of parents were kind of thrust into being like automatic, like homeschool teachers. Um, I was fortunate at the, at the fact that I was already homeschooling my children before the pandemic, but I just kind of think about the experience of a lot of parents who were just kind of like, just kind of thrown into this thing where they were having, having to work from home, teach their kids, be daycare, kind of do all these things at the same time. Another goal, for my, goal of myself for this work was to challenge myself with my carving technique. Um, so I wanted to include um, as many different types of like surfaces and textures as possible. Here, and you can kind of see a close up of that scene. Okay, this next section of this work is titled Dinner Time. So you can kind of see the action of what's happening. It kind of represents like the climax of the day. Um, so when I was organizing the figures and kind of placing people, I was very, very strategic about where people were going to be situated, um, particularly my figure. So I generally started with my figure and then kind of placed everybody else around me since um, I'm kind of showing you this lens like through, through my experience. Um, and so this is the only panel... Um, in the series while I'm kind of standing and I'm kind of in the central part of the composition. So when you look at all the works together, it's kind of like an arc that's based on, um, on my figure. I also wanted my husband to be um, active in this image as well, just to kind of, you know, acknowledge that I don't do everything on my own, that my husband is very, very supportive um, and, and very, very instrumental, not only in my, like, my practice as an artist, but just with our family in general. Um, you can see a couple uh, more artworks listed here. Uh, so the work in the middle um, is a nod to Valerie Maynard, who is a local uh, Baltimore artist, amazing printmaker. Um, yeah, I believe she just had her first retrospective show at the Baltimore Museum of Art, I believe, last year. Uh, so I put that there because I feel like it kind of matched the silhouette of my figure. And then um, the other work in this piece is a nod to Carrie James Marshall, who I just... Um, yeah, his work has been like so instrumental in my practice, but it kind of foreshadows the relationship between me and my husband. So you can see kind of here a couple uh, who is like in engaged. Um, so just kind of um, for me, uh, the sentiment is like acknowledging the relationship between me and my partner um, and making sure that, you know, we keep that strong. And then I really enjoy this scene just because there's a lot of different uh, surface textures, a lot of different things I wanted to challenge myself with in terms of figuring out how to replicate these things with my carving. Okay, the fourth scene is um, bedtime for the boys. Uh, another goal of mine for this work was to really have a sense of identity, not only with the people occupying the spaces, but with the, with the spaces themselves. So I'm thinking about each of the rooms as a character in and of itself. Um, and so I wanted things to be feel really specific to the type of the people that will be occupying the space. And so since this is my um, children's room, you know, I wanted to, to really feel like it was a space that belonged to them. Um, so you can see like a lot of their toys on the floor. Um, I also wanted to make sure to include some of their artwork um, in this uh, series as well. So I like literally asked them to give me like works that they enjoyed so I can put it in the work, um, which they were really like excited about that. So you can kind of see uh, a close up. Um, there's also a nod to uh, Basquiat in this piece. And then the image on the left is um, one of my husband's artworks. And then in this last scene, it's like the style of the studio. So after all the all the day, I'm finally able to kind of step into my role um, as an artist. So I'm taking off the mom hat and the educator hat and putting on um, this role of the artist. So this is an actual um, image of me in my studio space. Uh, so with a lot of the other scenes, I kind of had to work um, for maybe about eight or different eight or seven different photo references and kind of choreograph things and put them together. Um, I didn't have to do that as much with this uh, particular work because it's pretty much a clear cut um, representation of like this, again, actually the space that I'm talking from now. Um, so I wanted to show different um, works in progress in different stages. So one is complete. So like this is like the image that I showed you earlier with the gray background. I have a woodcut in progress on the floor. Um, finished works kind of stored in the back. 
So just kind of giving you a peek into the kind of process of being an artist. Um, another thing that I feel like is significant about this work is the particular pose that I'm in. Um, it's the first instance where I'm actually making contact with the artist and a lot of the other scenes, I'm either looking at my children or kind of looking down, um, but I wanted to, to make eye contact with the artist in this last scene to where I feel like this is kind of the moment where I'm stepping into myself. So I'm not somebody's mom, I'm not somebody's teacher. This is Latoya, the artist in her studio. Um, it's also a reference to another Carrie James Marshall painting. I did include those images for the sake of time, um, but the, the, one of my favorite paintings of his is a series of, um, I think, young artists that he did. And so uh, with my favorite work, the artist is kind of holding this palette in the same manner. Um, I feel like these work are also kind of a nod to like history paintings. So thinking about like um, this heroic type of figure. Uh, so I like the fact that I am showing uh, other, other ways that can be heroic um, than we normally think about with like history paintings. And so here is uh, a detailed shot of that work. Yeah, I was so proud of like carving that palette. Like I was so perplexed about how, <laughs> how I was gonna do that, but I feel like I'm so proud of myself with that. <laughs> Okay, um, and so this is a shot of um, the works being installed. So this work is going to be included in an exhibition titled All Due Respect. It's gonna be at the Baltimore Museum of Art um, opening November 14th through April 3rd. So you guys will be able to see this work in person um, on the third floor of the Contemporary Ring. So also will be featured the works of Lauren Adams, Makita, who is of Michael faculty in the painting department, uh, Makita Huja and Cindy Chang, who is also a faculty here at MICA in the drawing department. Okay, and then last, um, I just want to show this image. So I was able to produce a set of prints from these blocks. Thankfully, um, I was able to hire somebody with a mobile printing press to come and print an edition for me. And so uh, this is an, an image of me at the High Point Center of pr for printmaking. I just had an opening there with some other uh, printmaking, um, so some other phenomenal Black women printmakers. Uh, so I wanted to show that image to end. Okay, um, so there's my email, um, lhobs at mica.edu. You can follow along with uh, me on IG at Latoya Hobbs. I've been kind of sharing um, the progress of this series and it's like development from the beginning. And also, uh, there's my website. And I think that's all I have. So I'm going to stop share. Yeah, Timo Latoya, thank you so much. I, I think it's really of such value. Um, for students to hear you speak on your work and um, how it directly relates to the content that they're working on in the forum classroom. Um, I'll be following up with some information on resources that Timo mentioned in their talk um, and also some resources that uh, Latoya mentioned in her talk um, along with the recording of this that will be available um, on the FYE YouTube link. Uh, one more note before we go, FYE social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram, um, have been made and we would love your connection, broader sharing and following at FYE MICA and hashtag FYE MICA. Uh, following the core values of MICA, we would like this to be a platform for sharing great moments and highlights during your first year experience. Um, thank you all, all so much and uh, we'll see you at the next one. <laughs>